Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Green. I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative at Brown University and a professor of Portuguese, Brazilian history and culture. And uh, it's my great honor today to introduce a former doctoral student at Brown University. Professor Zachary Morgan is a modern Latin American historian and works on race, abolition, and slavery focusing primarily on Brazil in the 19th and early 20th century, as well as the African diaspora throughout the Americas. His first book was Legacy of the Lash, Race and Corporal Punishment in the Brazilian Navy and the Atlantic World, published by Indiana University Press. Um, and it's part of the Blacks and the Diaspora series. It was published in 2014. And again, this is the product of his doctoral dissertation at Brown University. So we're really happy to welcome Zach back to a place that he, I guess, had good positive experiences, maybe at the graduate student bar or other places, I don't really know. Uh, it, the book is an examination of the organized resistance among Afro-Brazilian sailors to the ongoing abuse that they endured in the Navy at the hands of the Brazilian state. The book's cornerstone is an exploration of the four-day revolt of Shibata, the revolt of the Lash, of November 1910, during which nearly half of Rio de Janeiro's enlisted men rebelled against the use of corporal punishment in the Navy. He argues that the uprising is best understood in the context of Atlantic slave rebellions rather than exclusively as a modern military revolt. Professor Morgan is currently working on a research project tentatively titled Forced Labor in Brazil's Age of Abolition, State Control of Free Afro-Brazilians During the Empire and Early Republic that examines the means by which the Brazilian state, in conjunction with state-run institutions such as the Army, Navy, legislature, uh, police force, and orphanages, coerced Brazil's growing free black population into continued labor as the institution of the Atlantic slavery collapsed during the second half of the 19th century. Uh, and before um, coming to Penn State University in 2016, he taught in the American Studies Department of the University of New Mexico and in the History Departments of Boston College and William Patterson University. So before interviewing him, I have a, an announcement to make about the Brazil Initiative. First, I'd like to thank Ramon Stern for organizing this event and all the events that he has done so wonderfully as our program administrator. But we have moved to a new building. The Brazil Initiative is part of the Watson Complex. I don't know if, if they have given the name to this new complex of a building constructed behind us and a house, Charles, Charlesville, Charles Field. And we're 59 Charles Field on the first floor, the first two offices. So if you're looking for Ramona for me, we're in that building, which is um, kind of blue next building. to this, it's the blue building next to this. It's a, a colonial, a 19th century house that, that is there, and we're on the first floor. Um, so. Um, as we move and modify. We're still part of the, the Watson complex, though. Um, just They're just reallocating space. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Zach. Thank you so much. Um, let me say what an honor it is to come back to Brown um, and to Providence. I was a student here, as, as um, Jim said, and worked with Tom Skidmore. Um, when I researched and wrote the project that would become my first book. Um, and it feels a little like a homecoming. Providence looks different than it did in 1992, I can assure you. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it's really, you, for, you, know, you forget how, how kind of um, heartwarming it is to walk through buildings where you have so much history and, and see a campus where you live so much of your life. Um, so it's really, it, it's great to be here. And I really want to thank, um, I want to thank Jim. Uh, I want to thank the Watson Institute or the Watson Complex now, is that? Okay. For International Public Affairs, the Brazil Initiative, Africana Studies, and the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice for sponsoring the talk. And I really want to thank Ramon, um, who, who organized this trip not once but twice um, because I was supposed to come in March and it was canceled by an ice storm. Um, so my talk today draws from my second book project, um, which Jim just introduced. Um, it's very much a work in progress. I've been, I was down in Brazil um, this summer and I'm kind of starting to put together primary archives. Um, but it's, it, it, it's, um, well, it's a work in progress. <laughs> so I, I look forward to the Q&A, but also um, my email is on the screen if you have any uh, insightful um, critiques or, or um, suggestions, I'd really appreciate it. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, and so the project has origins um, in my first book, Legacy of the Lash. So I'll take just a couple minutes, not to introduce the whole thing, but I want to talk about some of the themes that I think are important um, in that project that led to what I'm trying to do now. 
um, and point out kind of how it's a stepping stone to what I'm doing. So the Hevota de Shibata, on, on November 22nd, 1910, around 10 p.m., about half of the, the, the enlisted men in the Brazilian Navy um, stationed in Rio de Janeiro rose in what would be called the Hevota, uh, Hevota de Shibata, or the Revolt of the Lash. Um, and they revolted against the violent mistreatment they identified taking place in the Brazilian Navy. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the things that I point out are, are that this is an incredibly modern um, revolt, right? These are battleships that, that, that Brazil had just purchased from shipyards in Great Britain. They purchased the first dreadnought battleships that were sold on the international market. Um, both of the two of the dreadnought battleships that were delivered earlier that year in 1910, the Sao Paulo and the Minas Gerais, um, revolted hundreds of enlisted men on, on these ships as well as the light cruiser Bahia and older coastal defense vessels Diodoro rose up against the officers on board their ships, took over the ships. Um, the revolt was triggered by um, the lashing of a sailor, his name was Marcelino Rodriguez Menin, uh, Menezes, aboard the dreadnought ba Minas Gerais. He was lashed reportedly, and there's some debate about this in the various archives, in the various sources, 250 times. Um, when the government negotiator came on board during the revolt and examined him, um, he took him back for, for, for medical treatment and stated, quote, the back of this sailor resembles a mullet sliced open for salting. Um, the rebels who identified themselves to the press as the Hecla Manches or the aggrieved, um, under the leadership of, of Seaman First Class Real Candidu, um, besieged the Brazilian capital of Rio de Janeiro, held it for four days until the government acquiesced to their demands. Uh, though the Hecla Manches complained about both low pay and difficult circumstances, the, the primary complaint they had was the immediate end of the use of the corporal punishment as a means of disciplining Brazilian sailors. Um, we can talk about, um, if you have any questions, about the revolt, um, about how the Brazilian Navy looks different from uh, European navies or the American Navy, how corporal punishment is used. I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, but on the, early in the morning, on the first night of the revolt, so by then it was November 23rd, um, a wounded sergeant brings, oh, I meant to show that a minute ago, I'll come back to it, brings the statement, um, their complaint. We as sailors, Brazilian citizens, and supporters of the Republic can no longer endure the slavery practiced in the Brazilian Navy. And this is, this is the thing that I focus on in the book, and this is the thing that, um, that, I, that troubled me, that kind of brought me towards um, my second project. This idea of their description of their treatment at the hands of the government is slavery. Um, I've kind of flip-flopped on it. I've, I've changed my mind a bit because I took them at their word. I did research to look at the way corporal punishment was applied, looked at the way that they were um, forced and often conscripted into service, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and, you know, as Jim um, mentioned in, in the statement on Penn State, I do think that it needs to be understood in the context of slavery. But this idea that, you know, at the end of the first decade of the 20th century, sailors asserting their rights as Brazilian citizens who were describing naval service in this period as being akin to slavery, I think, rings true. Um, throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries, sailors who came into the Navy came in by one of three ways, right? You could volunteer, you could walk up and say, hey, I want to be a, 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 a sailor. Um, alternatively, they were conscripted into service by means of forced recruitment through police and military sweeps. Um, and finally, young boys between the ages of 10 and 17 in theory, but sometimes as young as 7 and 17, were accepted as naval apprentices. When turned over by their legal guardians, a boy's parent might be the most obvious guardian, but in fact this was a means for the, for the judge responsible for orphans to move young boys into naval service most of the time. Um, and all of these methods of entering into the Navy um, appear in the archives. But actual volunteer rates are incredibly low. Um, more than 97% entered either as forced conscripts or as children who were turned over to the institution. To actually volunteer for service is rare. Of more than 16,000 men who entered the Navy as enlisted men between 1836 and 1888, only 460 actually volunteered, um, about 4.85%. So naval service 
I meant to start a timer to make sure I didn't run long, and I forgot to, so I'm already running long. Naval service during this period was described, was understood as being um, cruel and harsh. Um, more, office, more often than not, people served far from their homes. There were a great number of people who were enlisted from the Northeast um, to serve the, the, the capital. Um, they were measurably mistreated. Corporal punishment, which I'll talk about a little bit, existed. But also, um, you know, a crew on their way to um, be trained on these modern battleships so they were going from Rio to Newcastle, had an outbreak of beriberi, um, which is a disease um, brought on by an acute lack of vitamin B1. Um, it was almost unheard of in the 20th century, um, and it was certainly unheard of in modern navies. Um, it only existed on plantations in the Northeast and in some Asian plantations in which um, very limited foods um, were given to people. So this is, a, this is a navy which is in one way modern, Right? In one way, as modern as any navy in the world, and in another way, um, was really tied to um, ancient methods of controls. Um, and the navy enjoyed such a strong reputation of being a terrible place um, that it was used as a sort of boogeyman. Parents would threaten their misbehaving boys. I have two boys, seven and ten, and I would certainly use it myself. You know, if you don't, if you don't stop that, I will, I will give you to the apprenticeship school. I will take the money and turn you over to the state, right? Um, it, was, it was the boogeyman to, with which you could threaten um, children. One historian describes the ships of the Brazilian Navy um, in this era as a, quote, series of mobile prisons. Another stated that the lower decks of the Navy consisted of the, quote, dregs of our urban centers, the most worthless lumpen without preparation of any sort, um, and that ex-slaves and the sons of slaves make up our ship's crews. Finally, one naval officer described service in the era of the revolt stated, our Navy serves as a sewer for our society. Um, in describing the lower decks, and I'm going to quote a little bit at length, because I think it's an interesting quote as we talk about what ties the two projects together. The first impression of a Brazilian garrison is that of decay and physical disability. The blacks are underdeveloped and shifty, showing all the signs of depravity common to the most backward African nations. The other races submitted to the influence of the blacks who are always in the majority, right? So white people become like black people and through service. In our Navy, the normal framework consists of the abandonment of 12 or 15 virtually defenseless officers to command 400 to 500 sailors. Only one force can ensure discipline, moral force, a force moral. Only one element constitutes that moral force amongst the most backward and rudimentary, the fear of physical punishment, right? So I don't go into the kind of demographics of the Navy. Um, it is overwhelmingly um, Afro-Brazilian. I should also mention, because I know that it um, sometimes raises hackles, that I use the shorthand of, of, of Afro-Brazilian when I'm talking about um, these populations that obviously we all know can be, can be described using much kind of a finer comb. Um, I follow the lead of um, a lot of the Afro-Latin American scholarship, which um, when looking at the way that race functions in societies, um, the most important break in racial definitions is between white and non-white, right? Um, that though um, mulatos and, and quadroons and nachroons and fulas and cowders and all of these terms are, are, are important to people in the society that really once you're not white, um, there's a great amount of similarity. And so this shorthand both for um, discussions of Afro-Latin American studies um, and talking about Afro-Brazil within a broader context, I, I, I do that. But of course I address those differences in, the, in, in my broader work. Um, I also don't focus when I'm using some of the um, slides to look at the race of the nation. I'm not really focusing on indigenous populations at this point, not, per, not, not to say that they're unimportant, it's just for, um, for this discussion, um, dropping them out of some of the statistics about black, white, free, slave um, makes the pie charts more legible, right? Um, so, to coerce labor from contributed sailors, Officers use the lash much like a plantation owner, right? Um, officers and slave owners face similar patterns of resistance and domination. Um, desertion and subordination were the crimes that when I looked through the, the about 50 years worth of court martial documents in the Navy and kind of list what crimes we're dealing with, they're very similar to what um, a plantation owner um, would see himself dealing with. 
Um, they were dealt with violently, ritualistically, right? Of course, the entire crew, non-essential crew of the ships came up to witness lashings, um, one of which is described up here. I'll save you um, my reading it. Um, the head officer on board a ship traditionally dealt with most minor infractions, public drunkenness, gambling, assault, insubordination, desertion, acts of sexual immorality, um, rather than jailing a man, carrying out um, trials that would take labor off of ships, um, they generally took care of it using the lash. Naval punishment was immediate and violent. Um, there was no defense, no appeal. In the eyes of naval officers and slave owners alike, their institutions could not run without the liberal application of the lash. So returning to the um claims of being treated like slaves, describing naval service as slavery is not empty rhetoric. I'm not challenging the fact that they were mistreated, but as I mulled over the treatment of sailors in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and more broadly, the treatment of Brazil's desprotegidos, it's, its unprotected populations, its poor populations, and this includes both white and black poor, um, though often we can racialize those populations pretty easily, but of course there were poor whites caught up in the military, in the Navy, um, in favelas. Um, but but un, this idea of their lives being best understood as a sort of proto-slavery increasingly troubled me and increasingly troubles me. Um, and if given, it, given the choice to do over, I probably would have written um, the book a little differently because obviously the institution of slavery has an enormous impact on Brazil, right? Um, plantation slavery, urban slavery, um, agricultural slavery, mining slavery um, defines the population of the nation. Um, it, it, it has an enormous impact on society, both as a colonial society and as a free society, right? But I think collectively, modern scholarship, and this applies to scholars both in the US and in Brazil, though there have been some very um, excellent work on free black populations in the 19th century um, that you know I rely on and that, that, that I think are very engaged with the same sort of work I'm trying to do. Um, it often overlooks the significance of Brazil's free and freed black populations. So the first intervention I want to make with this project is to understand why, right? Why is it that this idea of post abolição becomes so integral to the way that the canon of scholarship on race is pitched, as if the important developments um, in the control of black populations take place after the abolition of slavery, right? In scholarship on slavery and race in the Americas, the legal and formal abolition of slavery, the dates that the government takes formal steps to limit first the transportation and sale, then the ownership of African, African-American, Afro-Brazilian, Afro-Latin American men, women, and children, too often represents the formative shift in the transition of the enslaved American population from property to citizenship. As if on that date of abolition, as Brazil becomes free, we deal for the first time with the citizenship of its population. Now, I don't want, it's not my, my, my intention to undermine the importance of the, the, the popular diplomatic institutional legislative struggles over the abolition um, of slavery in both the Atlantic slave trade and the institution of slavery, informing the histories of Afro-descended people in the Americas, and really in writing the very histories of America, right? Those laws, those policies, those ideas, the way that abolition is struggled for is hugely important. Um, that said, there is a way in which at a much earlier time than the abolition of slavery in 1888 or the abolition of the slave trade in 1850, that the state has already created institutional controls over free black populations. Um, clearly, you can go back to the, to the colonial period, um, but I choose to, to start this examination around the period of independence um, in the 1820s and look at the way that various institutions, um, military, obviously, the police and prisons, um, legislation on land reform, on labor contracts, um, the policies towards orphanages. There will be nearly 35,000 children um, placed into the, um, into the Hoda 
in Santa Teresa alone between the mid 18th century and the mid 19th century, there's a huge number of children who are becoming state responsibility and these children are, are, are arguably people talk about them being turned into citizens, turned into workers. It's about improvement, right? The same language applies to the apprenticeship schools for the Navy and the Army. We're helping these children become citizens, become better than their parents, um, become acceptable Brazilians. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think there's kind of a comparison to the, 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 the way that racial democracy existed as an idea of uplift before it didn't, right? Before UNESCO and before um, the overturning of Gilberto Freire, there was this idea that racial democracy was benevolent, that's, that, that race was benevolent in Brazil. That was the argument that people were making. And that obviously has been severely undermined and critiqued. But as you read studies of orphanage policy, as you read studies that are taking children from their family um, and turning them over into the military, there's still this willingness to apply that same sort of benevolence. This is for the good of children. This is for the good of society, right? But in fact, what it's doing is it's extracting labor. It is turning people into workers. It is forcing people to become workers. It is scaring people because of the risk of um, military conscription as you leave rural countrysides to head towards cities, as you look for e economic opportunity, as you look to take advantage of freedom and growth, it scares people into remaining where they are. So even though they don't exist in this negotiation with the state, we can see the, the, the impact of such legislation. Um, and so I would argue that, that these institutions that I'll talk a little bit more about, so efficiently and explicitly controlled poor people, but less explicitly controlled free and free back of Brazilian people, that state-sponsored segregation and black codes become unnecessary after abolition. Um, additionally, I argue that this lack of formal de jure segregation, black codes, widespread systematic state violence in Brazil and in other places, right? When I was educated um, as a scholar interested in Afro-Latin America, it seemed like, and I have some examples later in the paper, um, there was always this question of why doesn't Cuba have the sort of lynching or, or segregation? Why doesn't Brazil, um, why don't we see these kind of um, institutionalization of racist controls over populations? And what we're seeing is a normalization of what happens in the United States. Right? We're seeing a, a normalization of Jim Crow laws. We're seeing a normalization of black codes. Um, but when we really look at the numbers and we look at how abolition comes to the US, we see that the US is really the overwhelming outlier of the rest of Latin America. We see that um, the situation that takes place in the United States is, well, just about unique, right? A, a white northern occupation of a southern population, um, reconstruction and post-reconstruction policies which lead to um, prison leasing policies, which lead to debt peonage, which of course we obviously see in Brazil, which lead to 5,000 people being lynched in the late 19th century, 4,000 of whom are African American. Um, we see all of these policies which are a response to not just black and white, but to a military occupation and a civil war that leads to abolition in the United States. Um, so the, the kind of, the questions about Afro-Latin America um, and the analysis of free black populations, whether in Brazil, Cuba, Colombia, um, Peru, is always framed by the lack of de jure segregation, the lack of state violence, and of course we can find that state violence if we look for it, it's, not just, it's just not as institutionalized. Um, it's, it's framed as the kind of policies that are implemented in the United States after abolition. So for historians of the US, race, slavery, abolition, the value of temporal models formed around this post-abolition control of free black populations is obvious, right? In the last decade of the 18th century, the establishment of cotton crops in the US resulted in the expansion and radical transformation of US plantation society from the upper south, the Chesapeake, um, North Carolina, into the deep south, into the, the expansive cotton regions of the lower south and the territories that were um, purchased through the, the Louisiana Purchase, 
the displacement of indigenous North American groups from the Southeast, the mid 19th century invasion and seizure of Mexican territories allowed for this almost endless expansion of cotton into the interior. And this expansion of lands dedicated to cotton growth required a dramatic expansion in the number of enslaved men and women who exploited this product. However, the overwhelming majority of this growth takes place after the US government legislated and implemented the end of the slave trade, right? Um, in 1808, for the US slave population to expand from about 700,000 people in 1790, uh, I will. Oh, I put those in the wrong order. Okay. Um, to about 4 million in 1860 at the start of the Civil War, the most significant commodity being exported from the upper plantation region, the region of the upper south, had by the early 19th century become enslaved Africans themselves, right? Um, to, to, to expand a slave population with very limited importation by 10 times over 70 years takes some very specific controls. Um, five times, I'm sorry I said 10 times, I meant five times in 70 years. The natural reproduction and expansion of the slave population is, is just one way that the US is, is, is a serious outlier from the other two centers of what some people talk about as the second slavery, the modern plantation slavery of the 19th century, which is represented by sugar in Cuba, coffee in Brazil, cotton in the United States. Um, two policies, distinct but deeply related, made possible this unprecedented expansion um, in the U.S. slave community. Because for slavery in the U.S. South, not only to survive but to expand beyond the number seen in 1808, um, plantation owners needed enslaved mothers who give birth to children who survive to adulthood in ever-increasing numbers, right? Moreover, pressure to, to maximize the enslaved population drove both legislation and popular practice to curtail the manumission of slaves, to control the establishment of significant free black populations. And these restrictions were far more visible in the cotton producing lower south than they were in the slave producing upper south. Um, so according to the census, and, and I'll, I can kind of skip over some of these numbers by the fact that they're up here on a slide. Um, in 1790, out of a population of about 4 million people, there were 700,000 slaves. They, again, this is all ballpark, but the numbers are up there. Um, and about 60,000 free blacks. The slaves represent less than 18% um, of the population. Free blacks make up about a percentage and a half of the US population. Furthermore, free black population represents about 9% of the enslaved population, right? Um, according to Ira Berlin, that number is never going to shift much further away than from 12%, right? So though a free black population exists, um, it is of limited size. It is mostly in the north, right? Because as plantation slavery moves into the southern US, um, there, it is very restrictive about, about who can free blacks and where free blacks can be. Um, seven decades later, the 1860 census, free blacks still represent about 1.5% of the US population, um, now more than 30 million people, while slaves make up less than 13%. 12 and a half. Before the start of the US Civil War, the free black population of, of just under 500,000 people represented slightly more than 12% of the enslaved population of 4 million people. So there's a certain consistency. Slaves grow, free black populations grow, but those ratios stay pretty the same. Um, in contrast, the demographic significance of both Brazil's enslaved and free black, um, free Afro-Brazilian population in the 19th century was, was far greater. Right now, if I had larger slides or could have con condensed the text, I thought about making this the size of 2 million and that the size of 10, 10 million so we could see the growth in the overall Brazilian population. You'll just have to stick with me. Um, according to estimates, and of course we all know the census records of 1800 are not great in Brazil, um, but there's a lot of um, material that is put together by state, by state censuses. Um, and both Robert Salinas and um, Daryl Alden have done work which I find pretty compelling in terms of numbers. Um, the population of Brazil overall was about 2 million people. Free Afro-Brazilians numbered almost 600,000, about 30% of the population. Free whites represented a slightly smaller, um, almost 600,000. Again, the numbers are up there. Um, also about 30% of the population, if a slightly smaller uh, percentage than the 
free blacks. And enslaved Africans and Afro-Brazilians numbered 720,000 about, making them 37% of the overall population, right? When we look at what happens by 1872, which is still, you know, 16 years before abolition, um, all of these populations have grown. Um, but the enslaved population um, now represents 16% of the overall population. Free whites represent 40% of the population at shy of 4 million. And free Afro-Brazilians, 400,000 larger population um, than the free whites, represent a plurality at about 44%, maybe a little higher, depending on the numbers we look at. Um, this is a different world than the United States, right? Um, the United States, at its moment of abolition at the end of the Civil War, um, has to absorb, and certainly um, in the ideas of some white slave owners, expel um, a population of four million people that had very little place in the social workings of society. Um, The point I think that is most important of all these numbers is that not only did Brazil accommodate a much larger population of free black people, um, that according to some historians, that free black population was seen as a protection, right? Um, Luis Felipe de Alencastro explains that um, these considerable free black populations with origins in the colonial period um, were part of a deliberate Portuguese plan to build a buffer into the social and racial hierarchy between the white minority and the black majority. Their elevated status over Brazilian born blacks, who in turn enjoyed privileges over African born slaves, served as motivations for enslaved Africans and free Afro Brazilians to seek social improvement within the Brazilian slave system. Now, I'm, I don't entirely um, accept this argument. I know that there is violent resistance. There is um, fleeing plantations. The 19th century is filled with, um, with other ways to gain freedom. But the fact that there is this, uh, you know, uh, it's almost a Degler and mulatto there's escape hatch, but you don't have to be a mulatto. There is a, a escape hatch of freedom means that um, people can work within the, the hierarchy in the hopes of gaining improvement and gaining freedom. Um, For the United States, one need acknowledge the peculiar, almost unique set of circumstances that led to the U.S. Civil War and continued to shape post-war race relations. Um, slavery really divided the internal political landscape from the first days of nationhood. Um, the, the potential delayed secession of the African slave trade was written into the U.S. Constitution. For much of the 19th century, politicians from the southern slaveholding states dominated U.S. national politics. And so there's all of these kind of political moments in which slavery isn't just about labor. It's about which states are going to come in with voting rights. It's about which territories um, will have what political power and who controls the presidency, right? It's at the center of the Louisiana Purchase, of the Missouri Compromise. Um, the norm, nor, northern capitalization of the expansion of cotton in the 1830s, the acquisition of Texas, the non-acquisition of Cuba, and the acquisition of Puerto Rico, right? Um, each issue turned the topic of slavery and abolition into a dialogue as much about political control as it was about freedom. Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't need to, well, one, we're not a group of American historians. I don't need to go into great detail about the Civil War, I don't think. Um, but the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed slaves residing in rebellious states in, in 1863, the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution in December of 1865, um, we see the end of the institution of slavery in the Americas, except as a punishment for crime where, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. Um, and so this incorporation of four million black men and women as US citizens takes place under Reconstruction, during which rights of African Americans and their white Republican supporters were protected in large part through a military occupation of southern regions of the US Army. Um, with limited aid from the pitifully understaffed US Bureau of Refugees, freemen, and abandoned lands, better known as the Freemen's Bureau, active from 1865 to 72, African Americans voted. They served in public office. Um, they take over um, state political representation in some of the southern states where blacks hold a majority. 
Um, some gain access to lands belonging to their former owners. Many take advantage of public education and literacy programs. The goal of the Freedmen's Bureau was the reorganization of the post-war South, that such that former slaves and white, poor whites could live and work peacefully. Um, but among both slave owners and poor Southerners alike, Southern whites took Reconstruction as a humiliating occupation for which they sought revenge. If they couldn't focus their rage against members of the US Army or the Northern politicians, then they would retaliate against the former slaves, who when freedom and citizenship were offered, treated those things as their constitutional rights. So when the Freedmen's Bureau pulls out, we know with Reconstruction and Jackson, we have this repression of the legal rights of African-American former slaves. They lose the vote. Um, it's defined by state and private violence, um, forced labor, debt peonage, wrongful imprisonment, sexual assault, the loss of access to public education, the criminalization of vagrancy, which I think is important in both cases. So the study of race in the United States begins with black codes, false promises of reconstruction, Jim Crow laws and segregation, lynching, race in the criminal justice system, which in includes convict leasing, policing, and the growth of the penitentiary. These post-abolition themes represent an increasingly important core of the historical US canon, right? Um, and of course, I'm oversimplifying. Um, many of these things did start with free black populations before abolition, right? It's not like, um, there was no activization or there was no, there was no activity amongst free black populations. We know that's not true. Um, but overall, this, this civil war leaves an enormous impact on the understanding of race in the Americas. So, however, the absence of these recognizable forms of systemic racism are repeatedly used, historically and contemporary, as a shorthand for framing and contextualizing the nature of race in the Americas, right? Um, in his publications from the 1920s, um, activist and lawyer and mulatto Evaristo de Moraes recognized the peaceful and productive fusion of whites and blacks in Brazil in contrast to the segregation and lynchings taking place in the United States. In the introduction to an article, David Helwig, who did an inter uh, interesting book on, on the way that black Americans perceive Brazil, he states, quote, above all, one finds no tradition of racial violence or Jim Crow. Um, Anthony Marx in his study of, of Brazil, the United States, and South Africa, writes, quote, despite the commonality of early racism and continued inequity, Brazil did not enact anything equivalent to Jim Crow. These alternative outcomes pose a useful puzzle for comparative analysis. So for scholars of Latin American race, from both the US and Latin America, the fact that plantations or slave societies negotiated this transition from slavery to freedom without resorting to segregation and racial violence after abolition was an essential step towards understanding Afro-Latin America. And herein, I think, is the problem. The comparison was linked to claims of benevolence and racial acceptance. Um, the foundation of racial democracy, as I mentioned before, right? That there's this kind of um, inherent kindness or, or, or willingness to live along people who had, you had previously enslaved or from whom you had been previously enslaved. And that gets challenged and undermined. Um, but this kind of racial construction, though normalized thanks to the outsized and privileged role played by US scholarship on race, offers very little to help understand the lives and control of free Afro-Latin Americans or Afro-Brazilians. The US is simply too much of an outlier in terms of race in the Americas. Um, and so let me um, start with a kind of an alternate model. Um, in the age of Brazilian independence, the new empire was under enormous pressure from Brazilian policymakers to, to outlaw the slave trade. And there was a, you know, a weak abolitionist movement. And, and probably the best known um, member was Jose Bonifacio de Andraja e Silva, um, who, who prepared this memoir to address the general constituent and legislative assembly of the empire of Brazil. Now, as any of us who know much about Brazilian history um, know that, that um, he was removed from power, that, that constitutional um, assembly was, um, was broken up before they were able to write a constitution and before he was able to present this argument. Um, the argument itself, though, was published first in English, then French, then Portuguese, um, by abolition abolitionists in Europe when Bonifacio um, flees and lives in exile in Europe. Um, 
I don't think that the argument is terribly interesting. It does that thing where it um, uses slavery as a way to blame back black people for immoralizing and scandalizing good white people, right? It set out the, quote, necessity of abolishing the slave trade and gradually emancipating the existing slaves, um, but it was rooted in the well-worn patron... Uh, paternalistic tropes of a potentially great civilization that could not fulfill its future promise. He argued, we tyrannize over our slaves to reduce them to the state of brutish animals, and they in return initiate us in their immorality and teach us all their vices. But the thing that I thought was interesting is appended to his general argument. Bonifacio presents a set of articles called the, quote, the, the Plan for Gradual Emancipation of Slaves. And these articles represent a pragmatic roadmap, methods that would control and extract labor from a free Afro-Brazilian workforce that was gaining their freedom. It laid out steps for gradual abolition so as to achieve a goal without injury to society. Um, Article 8 called for former slave owners to continue care for the elderly or, or infirmed freed slaves. Article 10 calls for the granting of small parcels of land at the government expense. Um, Article 11 calls for owners known to have fathered a child with a slave to free the mother immediately and be responsible for the education and raising of that child. Um, corporal punishment would end immediately unless authorized by a judge. But what I thought was interesting is this clause here um, in which legal systems would have to be put in place. Remember, this is the early 1820s. So that idlers, beggars, and vagrants um, would not be tempted to refuse to work in a state which needed their work, right? And I'm not suggesting that Bonifacio, who, who wrote this thing that was originally published in Europe, um, had kind of surreptitiously roadmapped the way that we control free black people in the early 19th century Brazil. Instead, I think that this represented, um, you know, he wasn't alone in this belief. Um, if we take away the kind of um, belief in uplift, if we question whether the criminal code of 1830 wasn't really there to protect people from crime, but was in fact maybe created mostly to criminalize behaviors, um, that would allow you to put vagrants, idlers, beggars to work, then we can understand the 19th century in a very different way. Because when we look for the comparison, five minutes, okay. When we look for that comparison, when we look for the kind of where are the Jim Crow laws, where is the legislation, we don't need to look in the post-1888 period. We can look at the beginning of the 18th century, sorry, beginning of the 19th century, and see that, that they're already in place, right? Um, so the project, in conclusion, um, is an examination of how the Brazilian state um, creates institutions that would control a much more visual, present, activist, urban, black population um, during the time of slavery, not at its end, right? And so the, the way I envision the, the, the book, it really breaks down into three sections, right? Um, it looks at the various legislations through which you can control non-white populations, right? So we have the recruitment laws, which are rewritten in the 1820s. Um, we have these new vagrancy laws that become part of the criminal code of the Brazilian empire. Um, there are also some state-by-state -state um, passages of um, disciplinary agricultural colonies for vagrants and the unemployed in Pernambuco. There are some other ones. Contract labor laws, which, which I know um, Amelia Villa de Costa looked at and, and basically dismisses because they weren't widely applied, that not that many white people, white immigrants signed them, and very few black workers did. But I think the strength of these labor laws, which basically argue um, before you leave a job, you would have to repay everything that you had paid for the year. Um, you can't leave until the end of the uh, the end of the planting season. I don't think you need people to sign them to feel like these departures endanger them um, from police forces, from military conscription. Because similar to what we see in the United States, the, the patriarchy, the control of landowners over their now free labor becomes the most important thing. The 1850 land law, which basically says that you can't buy land unless you have a receipt from the state, that if you're squatting on land, it's not yours, and that there are no claims on land that are not paid for, um, all of these things act as a signal for populations who um, might want to seek improvement, seek modernity, seek change. And then, of course, you've got these institutions 
that are in place, many of them well before 1822, many of them, most of them are there in the colonial period, um, but that are applying these sorts of controls um, to populations selectively um, that are controlling a poor population in very specific ways, right? So the police force, and obviously um, there, there are several great studies about how the police force kind of takes on this role of controlling slaves um, in the transition from slavery to freedom. I will wrap up <laughs> right now. Please stop. There we go. Um, the Jurista Orfaon, there's been some, you know, interesting work um, on the way that these orphanages, as the populations became increasingly black after 1870, but also um, in other states, as, as slaves had already left the state to move, had been sold south, um, that's interesting, <laughs> that Orphans were used to pick cotton, that their labor was controlled while they were young, but also they served as direct entry into um, the apprenticeship companies which were established in the 1840s, um, military conscription of the Army and Navy, and prisons which um, increasingly became sources of labor. So I guess to, to, to sum up, um, free and free black Brazilians um, <coughs> serve a very predictable and understandable role, right? And so I think about Cindy, um, um, Cindy Chalubi's work on um, how free people can lose that freedom and be re-enslaved, or how um, free black populations are very much at the margins of society, and I agree with that. Um, I think Sydney's done some of the most important work on these populations, but I don't think it needs to be as piecemeal, right? If we pull together all these previous studies, if we pull together um, the policies of orphanages, if we pull together the police, if we pull together the prisons, if we pull together the, the um, Navy documents, they form a web which serves the same role as Jim Crow and segregationist laws, um, which controls societies in the same way. And it's simply that it doesn't exist in the post-abolitionist period that I feel like people have to some extent, to some large extent, missed the fact that those rules were in place. So some people have to leave because of course. class, but you should feel free to uh, field questions. Field questions, sure. I am here to field questions. I will go. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. But you mentioned uh, the priesthood became sources of labor. Can you have a mic? Sure. Um, you know, Thomas Holloway talks about talks about this. The with the with the increasingly modern prisons um, that are built in the I guess starting in the eighteen forties. Um, the 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 idea of them being casas de corazón, um, correctional institutions, as opposed to places where you were imprisoned with labor, um, became more regularized. And so the the idea that you would extract labor from prisoners um, as they were held, that they wouldn't be better that the idea of the criminal justice system wasn't to, to better individuals, or maybe being a worker was bettering the individual, but was the, the idea that you could actually extract valuable labor from people who were put in prison was an increasingly um, well-defined factor over the 19th century. Thank you. 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 I would like to hear from you a little bit about this perception that in Brazil we didn't have the Jim Crow laws after the Republic of sure. Because as I see from uh, when we had the constitution of 1891 and we had the prohibition for uh, people who doesn't know how to read or write sure. that they cannot vote. And when we had the, the possibility of imprisonment of those who were not working. Mm -hmm. And this legislation seems to me that there is their focus on free black people that does not, uh, they don't have uh, a possibility of working place. And therefore, I see it as a Jim Crow that is not true. That's not uh, homogeneous. I think, I think we agree, right? I mean, one, the vagrancy codes are, are put in place earlier, right, in the, in the 1830s. So that, that, I agree, is, is a way of controlling 
um, populations without having to racialize it. And obviously, limiting um, illiterate populations from voting is going to impact black people much more than it impacts white people because we can read the socioeconomics. But I think what it allows is for the kind of continued argument that um, this is about class, right? This isn't about race, even if who it impacts is racialized. And so when I did the book on the Navy, um, you know, 15 to 20 percent, probably about 15 percent of the naval population are white, right? I mean, there's no, um, there's no question that whiteness only buys you so much protection. But um, one thing that I found was interesting, I crunched all these numbers about corporal punishment in, in criminal cases. And um, so obviously, you know, you've got this big spreadsheet, you want to look and see, okay, who was it who was most lashed, right? Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, there was one sailor who was lashed something like 1,300 times over his career. He ran away, he was insubordinate, he attacked, a, he attacked an officer, and he was white, right? The most lashed person in the Navy in the late 19th century was a white sailor. And I thought like, oh, that screws with my whole argument because when I went into the archives, and this is of course the problem we have when we walk into archives, I think, I expected that white people would benefit from being white, right? And so there's this argument, right? There's this acceptance that um, the, the, the thing about racial democracy is that there should be racial fluidity, right? Like everybody, and you know, the example whenever I'm teaching undergrads, and I apologize for its crudeness, is that like, oh, everybody wants Paley to move in next door, right? I'm not a racist. Like, I can think of one rich black person who I would be perfectly happy to be friends with. That r racial mobility, which happens rarely on the top, but you can come up with examples, I think it's very easy to find at the bottom. If you have fallen so far that you've left the patriarchal protection of your whiteness, right? And you get picked up by a forced recruitment suite and nobody comes to get you and you've got a criminal record, then you can be treated like a black person, right? So you don't have to explicitly racialize um, these policies and these institutions and these legislations for them to be racialized and exceptions don't really keep them from being applied, right? So yeah, you're right. All of these are very easy to read as racialized. I think that, that's the argument I'm trying to make. So it's both temporal, right, that it's happening well before slavery is abolished because the free black population is so big before slavery is abolished. There's a remarkable document. Um, I can't remember. I ran across in the archive and I was like, I've found something really important. And then you search it and it like appears in somebody's book. And I'm like, okay, somebody else found something really important. But in 1826, when um, the government was trying to figure out exactly what it was spending and what it was making. It um, collected a lot of records of, of state institutions, including the police. And so the police had this document, which is in the Archivo Nacional, um, which is just a list, which is supposed to be a, a financial list, but it's a list of the money made for the police whipping slaves during the year of 1826, right? And it applied, there were, there were I think, 1,200 cases in it. So if you, if you run that backwards, that's good math, 50 a week, I, I don't know. Um, it's a quite regular process. And there were two policemen who did all of this lashing. Um, and they were always listed which one, who they lashed, who owned the slave. They didn't really care about what the penalty was, like what, what they had done wrong. But the state was already taking responsibility for the discipline and control, not only of slaves, but you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't like, oh, control of slaves is private and done by the owners, and the control of free black people is public, and so you get this transition as the population becomes free, that the police become more important in the control. The police were always part of that control. The state was already part of that control, both of free and enslaved populations. And so when you kind of move away from using abolition, whether it's of the slave trade or of slavery, as the defining factor, like, oh, I need to look for these things after abolition, I think that you begin to find them before. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, essentially, I think I agree with you. I'm just going to ask a very general question. If you could give us um, a bit of an idea of how diverse the occupations were that most Afro, free Afro-Brazilians were engaged in in the mid-19th century. Well, I mean, you know, I think that through a lot of secondary work, you see that um, except for a, a small number of bureaucracy working for the state, um, typesetting, um, you know, there were certain aspects that, that free blacks didn't do, but I, I, you know, I, the thing that's always remarkable when you 
something like um, Zephyr Frank's um, Dutra's world is that slaves were responsible for all of the manual labor in the city, right? Um, they were responsible for all of the manual labor. And so as the slave populations seep out of the cities, as, as Rio and Sao Paulo, well, Rio more, sell their slaves to the, to, to the coffee fields, that free black people wind up taking over all of that work before the widespread arrival of immigrants happens in the, in the late 19th century. So, um, you know, I think the, the, the kind of shorthand answer is that free blacks were doing all of the labor in the cities. Um, and of course, we also see those, you know, the writers and the intellectuals who, who um, succeed due to patriarchal relationships and have medical degrees and have law degrees. Um, those are much more exceptional, but they're represented almost everywhere. Um, the, the, when I think about some of the sources that I'm, that I'm finding, um, which are helpful to this argument, you know, I've worked with the Navy before, um, but there was, when I was down in, in Rio, I came across this collection of the letters that had been written um, to the Navy, or at least the hard fiches for them. I'll, I'll start pulling them when I go back. And between about 1824 and 1877, 2,000 letters were written to the Navy over one thing or other. They were just put in this filing cabinet. And of them, about 350, so what is that, um, 15, 18% were about getting people out of the Navy, right? My son was a minor, he was arrested, he was taken from the cost of the Deep Sound and put on a ship. Like, not an apprenticeship school. You know, he's nine and he's on a ship. Um, you know, I would, my slave was recruited um, and nobody noticed or believed him that he was a slave and so he has now been enlisted in the, in the Navy and I can prove um, that he's my possession, I need him back. It's worth noting that everybody who enlisted into the Navy was free, right? Just like all orphans were free. Um, the moment that you were left in the holdo at the orphan house, um, the law, it's a weird law actually, I don't really understand the motivation, but the Portuguese law that was continued by the, the Brazilian Empire was that orphans were freed. I was always amazed that slave mothers didn't simply walk to Santa Teresa and put their kids into that holdo and give them to the orphanage all the time so that they could free their slaves, and certainly that happened. It's so anonymous you can't tell how often. Um, but there is this way in which freedom is privilege, and so um, it's hard to find, it's hard to document poor black people. It's hard to, um, to, to each of these projects, I'm like, oh, how do I do the social history, you know, so it was court martial documents this first time, and here I think that these letters are going to be really helpful, because you have these hundreds of cases of people who are making claims about their children being wrongly impressed off the streets, um, about the free status, about, you know, showing up with, with birth certificates and arguing that um, my minor child has been wrongly brought into the apprenticeship school, he's only eight, and so he can't possibly serve. We don't know the results, right? They don't attach the outcomes. They're not like, oh, we returned this child. I suspect they didn't often return them. But, um, and we also don't necessarily know the race. If they're not talking about slavery, if they're not talking about free slaves, if they're not, but, but all of this about negotiation of getting out, or sometimes getting in, right? Widows um, who couldn't afford to raise children, um, if they didn't take up the option of um, of an orphanage, they would sometimes want their sons to go into the naval apprenticeship schools. And given how bad I think the understanding of what the Navy was like, it, it kind of tells you something about how impoverished and how difficult life must be um, when a husband dies and you're like, okay, I need my sons to go into the naval apprenticeship school. So those kind of entrances and exits, I think, will be really helpful for the project. Yeah? Thinking, thinking back to what you're saying and going back to uh, the orphanages and the widows, I think it's worth mentioning that around that time, women has no right. Women had no right. No, that's right. So, being a mother and being a widow and having children didn't mean anything because they didn't have any protection. No, that's right. So it was automatic that they will belong to the state uh, at their own pleasure, whatever laws or, or uh, jurisdiction they had. It was more power to the state and the military than to. And do you family itself? Do you feel like that truth, which I, I pretty much agree with you on, is represented by the historiography of Brazil? Do you feel like people think of the nineteenth century as a place where the state controls the well-being uh, of children? It can go either or. It depends who you ask. Yeah. I mean, it has to do with family values and historian and anecdotal 
history from the grandparents. Yeah. Communicating that way rather than academia. Yeah, I mean, Joan Mesner wrote an article on the cotton plantations in the north. Um, I forget what state. Um, it was in the mid 90s. But it was a remarkable study about um, how landowners, small landowners, after having sold their slaves south, and there were very few slaves, and there were free blacks, but they wouldn't pick cotton cheap enough to make it profitable, that they started going to the police to attack bad mothers to release their children to be raised by adopted parents who could then put them to work in cotton fields. And this wasn't like a couple cases. This was tons of cases. It was just widespread. Like, we're going to look at single mothers. We're going to look at mothers who don't have a legitimate claim to their children. Um, and, and we're going to say that we're going to improve the lives of these orphans while they put them to work during this brief cotton boom that was taking place in the, in the 19th century. It's remarkable how, you know, when you look at the kind of better established studies of orphanages, um, and those are almost all in Portuguese, there's, very few, there's not that much research on it in English, there is this assumption of benevolence. There is this assumption that at the end of the day, orphanages want to help people. And I think that they do, in some cases, they want to help white girls, right? They want to help people who they think have come from the right families and don't, shouldn't be out on the street. Um, but it seems, it feels obvious to me that they are part of a machine to turn what they see as, you know, dangerous, disprotegidos, dis these kind of, um, these poor elements of society into productive elements of society. And I think there's always an assumption that that productiveness is about citizenship, and really I think that productiveness is about labor. Okay. To this very day, yeah. I want to thank you very much, Zach. Sure, thanks so much for having me.